Um, well, this morning, uh, as we start uh, our sermon, it's entitled, as you see in your bulletin, it's entitled, Old Fashioned Communication. And before we start, I just want to ask, uh, did you see this in your bulletin today, the little study guide? Um, at this time, if you did not get a, st a study guide, uh, we have some deacons. Will you please raise your hand? If you're an adult and you did not get one of the adult study guides, man, everybody got one. Awesome, awesome. Well, we also, we made some for the young people. So if you're a young person and you didn't get one and you would like one, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, there's a section in there where it says word count. And if you can count how many times I say a word during the sermon correctly, I'll have a little prize for you. So if you're a young person, we got a young person, a few over here that didn't get one. If we can make sure every young person gets one. So keep your hand up uh, over there. The deacons are coming. And thank you. All right, well, this morning, our topic is old-fashioned communication. And to start, I would just like to take us on a journey through the evolution of communication. But we're going to do something a little different. Instead of going from the beginning to the end, we're going to start from where we are today and go backwards. So we're going to see how communication uh, evolved, developed. And every, nowadays, we have these fancy-dancy smartphones, don't we? These things can do everything but cook and clean. And if they could cook and clean, I would definitely buy one. But they can do almost pretty much anything. You, know, you, can, you can see someone's face via Skype or FaceTime who's on the other side of the world, which is pretty cool. But before that, you know what happened before we had these fancy dancy phones? We had email. And before we got email, we got the internet. And do you guys remember dial-up? The little, little noise it would make. But, but as we continue, before we, before we had the internet, if it will go, there we go, we had the good old mobile phones. The one where it came with security, you know, because if someone tried to take your phone, you just whack them with it. <laughs> but before we got the mobile phone, we got the fax machines, you know, those good old fax. And we still have, you know, they, we still use them today. And before that, we have the good old telephone, you know, the ones that you have to crank to listen to. And, and as we continue just down the history, we had good old radio. That's how we started communicating. And to this day, I still, I love going on uh, Adventist World Radio, and I love listening to some of the oldies, some of the HMS Richards, when they would go broadcast. And it, for me, I just love it, because they have the good old classics, and HMS preaches, and it, it's amazing. But we had, you know, the form of communication was radio. But, bef be but before radio, we had Morse code. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't know too much about Morse code. But here, if you, if you ever want to learn up on it, here's a little cheat sheet to learn how to, how to write, or how to dee 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 in it. And be <laughs> before we had Morse code, we had these lovely little guys where they would send messages by putting them on carrier pigeons. And you know, it was amazing. You know, this, this didn't happen, you know, too long ago. But now we're at smartphones. But before we had carrier pigeons, you know what the form of communication was? Man, I don't know about you, but how long has it been since you've done this? <laughs> I don't think I've ever done a spoke signal. But, that, but it'd be cool. But my question today is, what was the first ever form of communication? What was the first? I, I heard it. It was prayer. You know why? Because the first ever communication, if you believe in the Bible, was when Adam was first created, he talked to God. So the first ever form of communication was prayer. And if, you, and if in my words, I believe that prayer is the most important form of communication. So you can call me old-fashioned. But today, I, I want you to see, because not only was it the first form of communication, but if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 1, and it's, and it's what Tina wrote, uh, read for our scripture reading. Acts chapter 1. Verses 12 to 14. Acts chapter 1. Verses 12 to 14. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 And it says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. And where did they return from? Do you remember? From the mount. And Jesus had just ascended back into heaven. So he, they returned from the Mount of Olives, or Mount of Olives, and on a, a Sabbath day walk from the city. 
When they arrived, they went upstairs to a room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphys, and Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in what? In prayer. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So right after Jesus went up to heaven, what did the early church do? What was the first thing they did? Prayer. prayer. They had a prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting. You know, what's so interesting about this is that the early church started with prayer. And you know, if we want to go back, if we want to be like the early church, you know what we need to start with? Prayer. So this morning, let's, let's start with prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord our God, God, this morning as we learn, learn more about communicating with you, uh, Lord, we're just so honored and privileged to know that you are God who loves us and who wants to talk to us. Um, Lord, we just pray that you open our minds and our ears to learn more about how to communicate with you. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> So as we continue today, we're going to look a little bit more into prayer. But before we go too much into prayer, we've got to answer one fundamental question. And that question is, why do we pray? Why do we pray? Is there, is there anything in Scripture that tells us why we pray? And to look at this, go with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And we're going to see here the first reason on why we pray. Mark chapter 1. Verse 35. And God's word says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, go with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 46. Mark chapter 6. Verse 46. And I'm sorry, this, this morning you're going to get a, a Bible workout. So uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 46. And it says, after leaving them, in Mark chapter 6, verse 46, it says, after leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. All right, now we're going to jump a few books over and go to Luke. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. The next book over. Well, Luke chapter 5, verse 16. And Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. All right, now we're going to go to chapter 6 of Luke. Chapter 6, verse 12. And, it, and when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 Sorry, you're getting your workout in for this morning. Uh, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying to God. So the first reason we see why we pray is because Jesus prayed. And so we, we label ourselves as Christians, right? And so to be a Christian, what does that mean? To be Christ-like. So to be Christ-like, what does that mean? I'll unpack that some more. We want to be like Christ. So that means we want to do the actions that Christ did, right? We want to follow what Christ did, his actions, his words. So to be Christians, if Jesus prayed, what should we do? We should pray. And I, I want to share with you uh, a quick quote from Steps to Christ. And, it, and Steps of Christ, this is one of my favorite books. If you've never read it, this is the book that changed my life. In Steps of Christ, page 94, it says, He is our example in all things. He, as in Jesus. He is a brother to our infirmities. In all points, tempted like we are. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus understands our struggles. And it says, but as a sinless one, his nature re, uh, reconciled from, recoiled from evil. He endured struggles and, tor and torture of soul in a world of sin. His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with his Father. And if the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should feeble, 
sinful mortals feel the necessity of fervent and constant prayer. One reason why we need, the first reason why we need to pray is because Jesus prayed. And if you're not convinced yet, there's just still one more reason. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. And here's the second reason we pray. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 It says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All right, now let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. And it says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And some versions say, pray to the Lord to send out workers into the field. Now go with me to Matthew 24, verse, verse 20. Matthew 24, verse 20. Matthew 24, verse 20. And it says, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Now go with me to Matthew 26, verse 41. And there's a point, there's a point. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. And in Matthew 26, verse 41, it says, Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And finally, two, two more Bible verses. Go with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. By the, by the end of this, you're going to know your Bible backwards and forwards. Amen? So Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And then it said, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And go skip two more chapters or three more chapters to uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. And it says, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And so through this all, we see the second reason we pray is because Jesus invites us to pray. Jesus wants us to pray. And how amazing is this? I don't, you've probably seen this scenario before, but have you ever seen a little kid who has just discovered the coolest thing in the whole world? And the first thing they want to do is after they discover this is they want to go tell mommy and daddy. Have you guys seen this before? And so they run to mommy and daddy and they're like, mommy, daddy, guess what, guess what? But their parents are talking to their friends, right? And the parents want to teach their kid a lesson about, you know, teach them a lesson about patience. So have you ever heard this line? And tell me if you had, not now, I'm busy. <laughs> have you ever heard this? I know, I've, I've heard this many times, not now, I'm busy. And you know, when you think about this, if anybody in this whole universe had the right to have this excuse, it would be God, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine all God has to do. God is in charge of the whole universe. He has to make sure that the gravitational forces are going right. He has to make sure that all the solar systems are just spinning correctly. He has to make sure that in on our world that our atmosphere is still staying together. He has to make sure that the oxygen levels are just right. And at the same time, he has billions, millions, or even quadrillions of, of people, angels, that are trying to talk to him, trying to have his attention. But yet, he's never too busy for us. How amazing is that? And I, and I want to share with you a quote from Steps of Christ. And when I, when I read this, I was just like, wow, what a, what a God we serve. It says, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. Keep everything. It says, you cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. Isn't that good? 
Because I don't know about you, but I, when I pray, I, I, I give it all to God. But you, it says we cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs on your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterance of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up the world. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that is in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. And he continues, says, there is no, and this is one of my favorite parts, there is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. Amen? There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No ex and anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is, un is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. And finally, the quote ends with this. It says, He heals the broken in heart, and He bindeth up their wombs. The relations between God and each soul, and I want you to listen to this. The relations between God and each soul are so distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share His watch care. Not another soul for whom He gave His beloved Son. How amazing is that? That when we pray, we can't overburden him. And even though God has all these things to take care of, his relationship with us is as if we're the only person in the whole universe. What a God we serve. So as we continue, we now know why, why we pray. But, but what is prayer? We, to answer this, to just say it simply, prayer is talking to God as you would a friend. And God, and God, and the amazing thing is in God's word, and we're going to read real fast, God gives us promises of what he is going to do when we pray. So turn with me to Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13. Jeremiah 29, 12 to 13. Jeremiah 29, 12 to 13. And I, I know we all know Jeremiah 29, 11. But Jeremiah 29, 12 to 13. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 And interesting enough, my favorite verses actually is in 11. My favorite verses is 12 and 13. I, I want you to see why. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Isn't that amazing? God will listen to us. He said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now I want you to turn back uh, a, a few books to Isaiah 65, verse 24. Isaiah 65, one book over to the left. Isaiah 65, verse 24. Isaiah 65, verse 24. And it says, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. How amazing is that? When we pray to God, he's listening to us as we speak. And it says, before they finish, I will answer. Now I want us to go, let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And that's Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 So in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9, it says, <clears throat> This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. So how amazing that it, prayer is talking to God and when we talk to God, he listens, believe in more listening, 
he answers. But we see there's another thing that prayer is. <clears throat> and it's found in Steps of Christ, page 94. It says, why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hands of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse? Where are treasured the boundless resources of the, of the omnipotence? And what's so amazing here is when we pray, it says that it's giving us the key to the heavenly storehouses. When we pray, it's giving God permission to work in our lives. And that brings out a question. Why do we need to give God permission to work in our lives? Well, you know, we, we're living right now in a great controversy, aren't we? And the devil has claimed that God is a tyrant, a controlling God. So because of that, God can't bless us like you like to. God can't work in our lives like you like to because it would take away our freedom of choice. Now, help us understand this. I, I want us to imagine there's a meth addict. And he's just, he loves his addiction. He doesn't want to give it away. And there's a meth addict. He's losing his job, his family, his life, everything. And so God looks down and his heart is broken. So God says, you know what? I'm just going to heal him of his meth addiction. So he takes it away. He takes away the addiction to meth. And I have a question for you. What, what do you think the meth addict's going to do? Is he going to be like, yes, I'm healed and go back to his family? Or is he going to go back to his addiction that he loves? And you see, this is the same thing in our lives. It, it doesn't make sense, but this is the same thing in our lives. That if God was to take away all our addiction, take away all our sin, but yet we still love sin, what are we going to go back to? Sin. So you see, God can't work in our lives unless we allow him. God can't forgive us, can't free us of our sins unless we're willing to give it to him. And this is why we need to allow God to have permission of our lives. And when we pray, he will answer. And, and, another, and another analogy, and I think I've shared this before, but it's found in the book of Jabez, which is a really interesting read. I read it my freshman year in college, and they make this cool analogy when it comes to this idea of giving God permission to bless your life. There's this analogy where this man, he makes it to heaven, and he meets his guardian angel. And the guardian angel starts to take him on a tour and starts to show him heaven. They see the sea of glass. They see the tree of life. And as they're walking, they look in the distance, and there is this warehouse. And the man looks over to his guardian angel, and he's like, what, what what's that? And the guardian angel's like, trust me, you don't want to go over there. And he's like, no, 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 I want to, you know, because when you tell a kid you don't want to see that, they want to go to it. So the young man, the young man goes over. And he goes to the, the warehouse, and he, he's looking in, and he's like, well, what's in there? And the angel again, the guardian angel, he's like, trust me, you don't want to go in there. He's like, yes, yes, I do. And he's like, okay. So he opens the door, and inside this warehouse, and this is just an analogy, there are racks upon racks upon racks of all these cool and amazing things. And he walks in, he's just like, whoa. And he's looking around, and at these racks, he's noticed that these are these nameplates. And he's looking at them, and he's like, hey, is there a rack with my name on it? And the guardian angel's like, there is, but trust me, you don't want to see it. And he's like, no, 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 I, I want to see it. So the guardian angel takes him to his name, his, his rack, and as he's looking there, he sees all these cool and amazing things. And he looks to the guardian angel and he says, what is this? And the guardian angel says, these are all the blessings that God wanted to give you, but you never asked for them. And you see, in our lives, God wants to free us from sin. Our lives, God wants to bless us. But we do not receive because we do not ask. And in two weeks, we're going to look at, because not only do we do not ask, but we do not ask with the right intentions. Because if we're clinging on to our sin and we say, God, take it, he can't do much about it, can he? And we're going to be looking at that in two weeks. But we see here that prayer is giving God permission to change our lives. But there's a third thing. There's a third thing that prayer is. And I, and, I found, and I like it here in Gospel Workers, page 135. It says, the spirit of prayer is a breathing out of the soul to God. And in Steps of Christ, it says that we should pray in family circles. And above all, we should not neglect secret prayer. For this is the life of the soul. It is impossible for the soul to flourish while prayer is neglected. So here we see that, so here we see that prayer is the breath of our soul. 
And, and I, I want to do an experiment real fast. And if you're uncomfortable doing it, it's okay. But it, I would like to challenge you to hold your breath with me for 10 seconds. You think you can do it? If not, you don't have to. But let, let's try to hold our breath for 10 seconds, all right? Three, two, one. <gasps> That, that wasn't too bad, was it? That wasn't too bad. And it, but, you know, we could do that. But if I asked you to hold it for two minutes, that would be a little harder, wouldn't it? No. What if I asked you to hold it for an hour? Do you think you could do it? No. <laughs> what about a day? No. no. A month? A year? No. Well, then how come we can go a whole day without praying? You know? If it is the breath, the life of our soul, how, can, how come we can go hours, if not days, without praying. You know, is, does it ever make you wonder why our souls feel so overwhelmed? Why we feel like we're dying? You know, it's because we're not letting our souls breathe. Because when we pray to God, He fills us with His power. He fills us with His love. He gives us the strength for the day. And you see, this is why we pray. And now to continue, we're going we're gonna to look at when to pray. So here we see what is prayer. We saw why we pray because Jesus did it and he invites us to. But now we're going to look at when to pray. So go back with me to Mark uh, chapter 1 verse 35. And we read this before. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. And it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So when did Jesus pray? In the morning. In many other places in the Bible, we see that Jesus would spend all night praying, wouldn't he? So Jesus, our example, prayed in the morning and in the evening. And I like to say the first thing we do when we wake up, and one of my mentors, who one of my pastor mentors, he told me, he's like, every day if the first voice you hear is in God, you've already started your, your day wrong. And I like to challenge that too. With every day with the first voice, the first person you talk to is in God, we've already started our day wrong. And so in the morning, the first thing we should do is we should pray. And you know what the last thing we should do every day is? Pray. So we see that morning and evening, we should pray. But I don't know about you, but there's a lot of time in between, isn't there? The morning and the evening, those are just a little things. So what should we do during the rest of the day? Exactly, exactly. But don't take my word for it. Don't take your word. Let's, let's see what the Bible says. So in Ephesians 6, verse 18, Ephesians 6, verse 18, Ephesians 6, verse 18. And when you get there, give me an amen. And it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, and be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now go with me to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And this is probably one of the longest verses you will ever read. What does it say? Pray continually or constantly. So how often are we supposed to pray? Oftenly. Constantly. And you see, this is why, because just as we need to breathe constantly, right? Right? Because if we stop breathing, they call that death. You die. In the same way as we have to breathe constantly, we need to be praying constantly. Amen. And, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when the idea of how can I pray constantly, that's, that sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? Kind of dainty, kind of like, you know what, daunting, how, how am I supposed to pray constantly? I have a question. Have you, have you ever had that significant other in your life? And you just want to talk to them constantly. And you know, when you talk to them, it's not hard to talk to them, is it? You're not like, oh man, I got to call my significant other. This is, ah, good morning. No, that doesn't happen. You call me like, hey, you know, your voice chains. 
And you know, it's the same thing when we talk to God because God is our best friend. And you know what's so amazing is our significant other, our spouse, our wife, our husband, they can't be with us always, but God can. And we just learned earlier that we are to give everything to God. Our joys, our sorrows, our fears, our anxieties, our stresses, our to-do list. And what's so amazing is as the day goes, we can just give them to God. And this is the amazing thing, as we learned last Sabbath, that God actually cares about it. I mean, it's one thing to tell someone who goes in one ear and out the other. But when we tell God, God cares about it. And he gives us the strength we need. So today, I want to challenge you to pray. And you know, there's one, one, more, one more quote from Steps of Christ that I want us to read. And it's found on page 94. And it says, What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who are subject to temptation when God's heart of infinite love yearns towards them, ready to give them more than they could ask or think, and yet they pray so little and have so little faith? My friends, I believe Jesus is coming again, don't you? Yeah. And if Jesus is coming soon, we need to pray, don't we? Yes. And I'm not just saying just once a day, not just saying at your meals, but we need to be constantly in communion with our Heavenly Father. <laughs> so this morning, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you have a to-do list for your to-do list, if you are stressed out, if you're sad, if you're feeling lonely, or no matter what's hitting you today, I'd like to challenge you to pray. And I want you, if you could take out your study guide. I'd like you to take out your study guide because I, I don't know about you, but I always hate when you hear that promotional speaker, someone talking, they tell you all these cool things, but then they don't give you something to do afterwards. So if you look on it on the back, you'll see action steps. And I'd like to challenge you this week, today, this, whenever, to, to try to do one of these. And the first one says, go on a prayer walk. And I know for me, when I was in college, I would go on a prayer walk, and it changed my life. Because, see, I wake up early in the morning, and then when you wake up early in the morning, I'll be honest, sometimes it's hard to stay awake. So, so to deal with that, to keep my mind on track, I would take a walk around Southwestern. And when I took a walk on Southwestern, my heart felt like I was actually with God. And so I'd like to challenge you, you know, take a walk with God. Take a prayer walk. Tell him about your day. Tell him about your family. Just talk to him. Let him know how you're doing. The second one is find a prayer partner. You know, Christians aren't supposed to be lone wolves. We're not supposed to be lone rangers. We need each other. So if you don't have a prayer partner, I'd like to challenge you this week to, to pray to God. Say, God, who can be my prayer partner? Who have you put in my life to help me on my spiritual walk? The next one, it says, pray with your family, or pray with family before bed. And if you're not doing this, I'd just like to ch challenge you to take that time. Pray with your children. Show them how they're to pray. And finally, the last one is start prayer journaling. And we're, we're going to get into this a little more as the series continue. But get a journal. If you're like me, sometimes my mind wanders, and you need to just sit down and start writing, that's okay. You know, start, whatever you do, just talk to God. Because I believe that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I want to know who's coming for me, don't you? Yes. So today I'd like to challenge you to pray. So let's pray. Then we follow Lord our God. Lord, this morning we learned why we pray, what is prayer, and when to pray, Lord. And Lord, all that's important, but the most amazing thing of it all is that you are a God in heaven who loves us, who wants to talk to us, and Lord, we are unworthy. But Lord, I just pray today that you help us to find time to pray, that Lord, our prayers will, will be straight to you, Lord, and that Lord, we will pray continuously. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you be with every person here, with their lives, with their families, and Lord, may we be a praying church. In your name I pray, amen.